Hey, what's up everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 3, the official video game where today we're going to be playing a custom replica version of the 2021 Indianapolis 3 Supercross in-game and talking about the real-life Indianapolis 3 Supercross. Uh, just kind of recapping everything that happened from the weekend, sharing some of my thoughts and opinions. If you guys clicked on this video, you already, already saw the thumbnail of this video and we are definitely going to talk about that. Uh, moment from this weekend's action. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to do qu two quick things. First of all, I wanted to apologize that I did not get an Indy 2 uh, race recap video out. Honestly, uh, it's been so, so busy over at racetracksonline.com trying to get stuff out. And uh, as you guys know, I work over there, so it's uh, we're just crazy. We're wide open doing a lot of stuff. So I just didn't have time really to get to it. Um, by the time I realized I was not really like going to get to it it was a little bit too late to like make an announcement and, like apologize so i'm doing that now uh just been hectic and then uh yeah so also another big kind of news piece i guess is uh anybody that's fans of pulpamex the pulpamex show i'm going to be in studio as the co-host this uh monday february 8th 2021 um for the you know whole five hour show of it so if you guys want to listen to some more Moto Talk, maybe you're a fan of Pulp, maybe you're not. If you want to listen into it, I'll be co-hosting the show. So uh, join in, call in if you have any questions for me or any, you know any questions about games or whatever. I'm sure Steve always has a reason for having me in studio, usually connecting to the gamer fans. So um, yeah, we're going to definitely talk about Moto. I'm sure we'll talk a lot about everything that's happened at these indie rounds on the show. And going to be a lot of fun. So please tune in. That's uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern on uh i think it's going to be on racer or on yeah on race strikes youtube channel right race strikes facebook race strikes youtube or is it pulp youtube and race strikes facebook something like that anyway uh be sure to tune in and check it out and look at listen to the podcast afterwards if you uh didn't tune in live so that's my announcements of the week all right let's jump in and talk about indy 3 and let's go right into the talking point that everybody's going to want to talk about i know you guys are here to, to hear my thoughts on it it is the vince freeze and Justin Barsha, Eli Tomac, contact, melee, whatever you want to call it, that happened late in the 450 main event at Indy 3. Justin Barsha was running third. Eli Tomac was behind him in fourth. They come up to lap Vince Freeze. And Vince Freeze kind of like cross jumps Justin Barsha before the Supercross triple. And Barsha falls, hits the ground pretty hard. Eli Tomac, nowhere to go, hits Barsha. Uh, Barsha doesn't get up for a little while, but he's already posted that uh, it sounds like he's okay and he's going to be in for Orlando this weekend. Uh, I, I would guess he got the wind knocked out of him by the way he kind of plowed into the face of the next jump and he went immediately to kind of like try, trying to hold like his chest slash ribs. That's usually the sign of someone that lost all the wind. Uh, so I think that's probably why he didn't get up fast, but he did finish the race. He actually did get up and cross the finish line in 19th. Uh, you could see him a couple laps later just rolling around as, as Roxon and Webb went by. And then uh, Tomac went down as well in that contact, got up right behind Marvin Muskan in fourth at the time. And just because NBC sucks, they went to showing the Cooper Webb passing Ken Roxon because of Dean Wilson incident that happened at Houston 3 a week before this. And uh, we missed the entire sequence of events that, or I guess that would have been two weeks before this. We missed the entire sequence of events, essentially, that led to Eli Tomac getting up in fourth and finishing seventh, which I'm sure was probably some interesting stuff back there to see, uh, you know, Mookie and Anderson and Osborne and all those guys battling with him. Um, seeing through, you know, everybody that was in there and we just completely missed it and nobody s apparently has seen it. I guess some people in the stadiums, the stadium would have seen it, but we have no idea why Eli Tomac got up and finished seventh after he got up in fourth. My guess is the bike was damaged or, or something along those lines. I don't think Eli Tomac just gets up in fourth and goes backwards like that without something weird. Uh, but he definitely did lose some positions. It's going to be kind of crucial uh, in talking about the championship a little bit, but let's go back to this freeze Barsha contact to start the whole thing, right? A lot of people are vilifying Freeze, and I think personally, rightfully so, because Freeze has been a long time nuisance on the track. He's done a lot of stupid moves. He just last round at Indy 2 uh, plowed into Ken Roxon after Roxon was trying to, or, or Roxon plowed into him after Roxon was trying to lap Freeze and Freeze wouldn't get out of the way. And then there was also an incident where Freeze held up Malcolm Stewart for quite a while at Indy 2. If you remember, um, Mookie put Freeze down in uh, the main event, I think it was, early in the main event. And when uh, Mook came up to lap Freeze, Freeze didn't really move. And it, I guess it actually cost Mookie a couple spots in the end. 
so there was a lot of people not too thrilled with Vince after just the last round, round five at Indy. And here we are in round six. He cross jumps Justin Barsha and, uh, you know, takes Barsha down and causes this whole melee to start. Now, a couple of things with this. The first thing I want to say about this is I do not believe this was intentional by Vince Freeze. There's some people saying that for the two or three corners before it, he wasn't getting out of the way and he was getting the blue flags and he just wasn't getting out of the way. I still don't think it was intentional. I think if it was intentional, you would have seen a much more egregious cross jump than that or something along those lines. And it was pretty bad, but I think what everybody kind of forgets about that section is the racing line was going to the inside in the 90 before it and fading from far right to far left to hit the super cross triple on that jump. So he kind of took the normal racing line. He just happened to have Justin Barsha on the outside of him. Now, whether he knew Justin was there or not, I don't know. If he knew he was there and still uh, did that line, then that's absolutely ridiculous. And I would cater to say that he should get like a one race ban or something like that. But I think that the actual move itself wasn't intentional or really all that bad. And we saw some other guys uh, have some close calls on that jump because a lot of guys uh, were electing to swing to the outside in that corner before and kind of like rail the berm and try to get like a better like pump drive into the supercross triple this jump right here. Uh, this track, by the way, it's, it's a mirrored version because you can't do right-handed first turn. So I flipped the track around. So that's why it might look a little bit funny. But anyway, I don't think Freeze did it intentionally. I just think that this is becoming too much of a pattern with Freeze already this year that it's getting out of hand a little bit and I can understand the frustration fans are having with him. If this was one incident, one issue or whatever, I would say mm, no, too much. Like you can't be mad at Freeze for this kind of like racing line incident where more or less Barsha, maybe he just misjudged how much space he had or whatever. Um, and. You know, Justin on his social media already came out and basically said, like, we all know who this guy is and, you know, didn't mention his name or anything like that, but more or less kind of just threw Freeze under the bus because I don't think a lot of these guys really enjoy racing with Freeze or being on the track. Like Ken Roxon even said it last week in the post-race pre post -race press conference that he's like, you know, I run into Freeze like every week it seems like anymore and it's just, I don't know what it is with this guy, but I always seem to find him on the track and uh, that's a, a similar story to a lot of people out there. So, you know, Freeze is what Freeze is at this point. And, you know, it's unfortunate because he's a good rider, but he just seems to not always be there mentally. And in this scenario, like, I think this is a bit of a mental lapse on his part because we just saw not that long ago what happens when riders refuse to adhere to blue flags and how bad it can go. And, you know, even if what had happened is he just held up Barsha a couple more turns and allowed Tomac to get close enough to, you know, let uh, Tomac by... I think Barsh just pissed at Freeze anyway then. Because then he's like, yo, you just cost me third place in the race and some championship points here. What the heck? But now Barsh is obviously going to be real ticked off. I'm sure Freeze is going to get lit up at some point. And, uh, you know, while I don't think Freeze did it intentionally, you just got to be smarter. You got to have a, a clear uh, shoulder, you know, head on your shoulders there. And when you get the blue flag, be mindful of where these guys are. Listen for them. Maybe Barsha went for a little bit too risky of a move right there by jumping to your left in a very interesting, inopportune position. However, don't take up the entire track. It's literally in the rule book that these lappers are supposed to like adhere to the blue flag, get out of the main line, let the leaders go, etc., etc. And the guy that was in front of him was Adam Enticknap, who he himself was lapping. Like it wasn't like he was right in the middle of this heated battle with someone for a position. He was about to lap somebody himself. So um, he had ample time to, you know, take the time necessary to let those guys go. He had just been lapped by Ken Roxon and Cooper Webb, so he knows what's going on. Like he knows that the race at the front is close. And uh, these guys are decent enough at marking what's going on to know uh, that those guys are catching him. You know, like he, he's got to be able to see that Tomac and Barsha are coming up behind him, you know, probably two or three laps before that because he could see them go in the opposite direction. And then suddenly when he can't see them go in the opposite direction and suddenly he's hearing some loud motorcycles behind him, got to move out of the way. Uh, so I think in this situation, like, yes, Vince Freeze in my opinion, deserves more of the blame because he, he did cross jump. If you go back and watch the video of it from behind, the front angle is a sucky, bad angle that you can't really see much, but the behind angle is very telling that Adam Enticknap kind of jumps Justin Barsha's line, which is like just to the left of the main rut that's there. And then he lands on pretty much the far left side of the track into the Supercross triple. Vince Freeze goes from inside that rut to landing on the very far left side of the track. 
So it's it's more of a cross jump than it is just a normal racing line, at least in my opinion. Do I think that it was intentional? No, but I think that he was a little bit too overzealous with his racing line when leaders are right behind him, and you've got to be better and more aware of that, in my opinion. Um, I know that some people are going to say, like, this is Barsha's fault or, you know, whatever, and, and karma for Barsha, for Barsha running into Kenny early in the race, and yada, 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 yada. But, I mean, I, in my opinion, I just think that you have to look at this from the take that Barsha came up to lap Freeze. He should have expected Freeze to get out of his way, especially when Freeze is not in a battle, and Freeze basically took the main line and then some, while Barsha's trying to pass him, line up a, a spot around the left side of the track to go down the inside on the Supercross triple, and Freeze jumps all the way across the track and takes Barsha down. And, uh, in turn, it pretty much destroyed Justin Barsha's title hopes, in my opinion. Uh, his chances were not that great at the time being anyway. Like, he was already uh, fourth in the championship. I think behind Kenny, he was, uh, you know, something like 26 or something points down coming into this round. So he, he was a little ways back. Uh, but he was still close enough that if Kenny imploded late and Eli's actually the one that's maybe going to win this title, that Barsha was still within striking distance of Eli, etc., etc. Now I think it's over for Barsha, and I think we're already down to more or less a three-horse race for this championship, uh, and it's getting there like really, really quickly. Um, because Barsha, I think he's like uh, 37 or 38 points back now. That's a big points haul to overcome, even if like Tomac is the next guy that he's got to get. Barsha is not straight up going to beat Eli Tomac for the next 11 rounds. I'm sorry. Like, it's just the reality of the situation. So he's got three guys ahead of him. All three of them look pretty great on point right now, at least for the most part. Tomac maybe looks the worst of the bunch, uh, but he still looks really close to the pace that we've seen him in past years. Roxon's on top of his game. Cooper Webb looked arguably the best he's looked all season uh, at Indy 3. And Barsha's got a huge, huge hole to dig himself out of now. And uh, I think that he's probably going to blame Vince Freeze for most of it. So I would expect in Orlando to see Freeze, if he's anywhere near Justin Barsha on the track, to get sent right into the Steve Mathis Memorial Nets or something along those lines. Um, anyway, that's my take. I don't want to keep you know dwelling on this situation. Let's move on from that and talk about some other things. Uh, first thing I want to hit on is Ken Roxon. Man, does he look real this year. This is... Uh, kind of starting to remind me a smidge of like 20 early 2015 Roxon, early 2017 Roxon. it's i don't think his outright speed is on par with what we saw for the first two rounds of 2017 but uh it's damn close and his mentality seems to be better and you know if you want to kind of make an argument here about when it's your year it's your year i don't think ken Roxon was the best rider in the main event personally speaking i think he got a start and kind of controlled the field from the front from the front there uh he gapped barsha when he needed to like got the adrenaline going after barsha kind of you know punted into the side of him and then picked up the pace and opened up a bit of a gap there so he didn't need to worry about justin anymore but i think webb was actually the guy that you know probably i don't want to say should have won that main event but was fast enough to win the main event he just didn't get there at the right time he missed a rhythm section with three laps to go that basically cost him being like nose to tail with kenny there with a few to go and it's you know it took him three laps basically to catch back up from blowing that rhythm lane and we all know how webb is on the last lap of the race and i'm sure he would have been able to size up something if he was a little bit closer but he's a little bit far back so by the time he got to kenny in the last couple of corners he didn't really have an opening to try something and that was all she wrote and kenny won the race so this was a night in my opinion where i didn't think kenny was like the fastest, the best, whatever you want to call it, but he won. And that is not something that Ken Roxon has done over the years, I think. Like, I think Roxon is either the best rider on the track and proves it or just, you know, finishes fifth kind of thing. Uh, and I think that he was not the best guy on the track and won the main event, and that's, that's going to be huge moving forward. Now, championship-wise, like I said, we're kind of moving down to a, I guess, like three-rider picture here with Webb, Tomac, and Kenny. Kenny's got a 16-point lead on Cooper and a 24-point lead on Tomac, and that's pretty big. Uh, everybody always talks about this stat, but nobody's ever come back from a deficit larger than 28 points and won a championship, and that was in uh, 1992 when Stanton came back to dethrone Bradshaw to win the championship. And, uh, you know, what I'm excited about for this championship at this point is we're almost in a reverse order in terms of how I think the second half of the championship is going to go. Uh, Eli Tomac starts every season slow and gets better as the season goes on as long as he stays healthy. 
and uh, I can foresee that happening. I can for him, foresee him going down to Orlando, the two Orlandos in Daytona, and sweeping them. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me. Cooper Webb looks like he's getting better. Looks like he's getting up to the strength that we kind of know him capable of doing. And, uh, you know, that 2019 Cooper Webb that was able to sneak wins in, in here and there uh, and, and do, you know, some real damage on nights when guys were having some rough nights aside of him, that guy's in the mix too. So that leaves Kenny at the top of the table with two guys that arguably are better in the second half of the season anyway. And Kenny, historically speaking, is not better in the second half of any season, including his championship seasons uh, in 2014 and 2016 outdoors. He was great in 2016 outdoors, but it was in the second half of the season that Eli Tomac took two motos away from him at uh, Washougal and took one away from him at Southwick and a couple things like that. And, you know, the dominance that you'd seen from early Ken Roxon in the season wasn't quite the same Ken Roxon we were seeing in the second half. He was still freaking fantastic. The Millville moto, uh, the second moto I think it was at Millville in 2016, was maybe the best Ken Roxon we've ever seen. But uh, point being is it seems like second half Kenny is like you're going to get a couple thirds here and there. You might get a couple, you know, hover around the fifth place ride kind of things. Historically speaking, is that Kenny this year? I don't know. I really don't. It could be completely different. It could be this walk home, take it all victory thing from Kenny at this point. However, past records do show that Roxon does a little bit more in the second half struggle than he does in the first half. He's statistically started season strong uh, year after year. I think four of his eight, I guess it would be eight seasons now in the 450 class, he's been the first rider to two wins on the season. And uh, now he's the first rider to three wins on the season, obviously. So I'm very excited about Ken Roxon's prospect for maybe getting this championship done this year. But as I'm saying, it's almost a reverse order. Kenny, not as strong in the second half. Cooper Webb is Cooper Webb. He's going to be strong pretty much throughout the season. And Tomac, historically, not great in January, great in every other month of Supercross history. So we'll see. This could be very interesting. Tomac could start clicking off wins. It could be... I hate to like draw this comparison, but it, it could be similar to 2009 where, you know, James came back from a huge deficit to get to Chad and then Chad won a race and then James started winning races and then Chad won another race and they, you know, came into the finale close in points and stuff like that. If that happens, like I'm not going to be shocked. I'm really not. I would not be surprised to see Tomac go on a serious roll here uh, just because he's back in more comfortable territory. You know, he's not really ever been like lights out in Indy. But he's always been pretty good in Florida, and Florida, I think he's going to do very well. Obviously, the Atlanta rounds are basically three Daytonas again with red clay. Uh, you know, I, he's done well in Atlanta in the past, so I wouldn't put it past that he can do well again there. Plus, it's basically Daytona layout, and Tomac rips Daytona. So I'm just kind of trying to get the, the championship picture built for you guys here where, you know what, maybe this is kind of for the better that Tomac is so far down in the points right now because he's got a hole to dig himself out of. And if he was going to go on a consistent streak of wins here from round six, and six until 13 anyway, it would suck if he goes, you know, wins, I don't know, five of the eight next rounds or something like that. And then before you know it, he's got a huge championship lead and this whole thing sucks. Like, it's kind of fun to see him have to chase for it. Um, you know, and from his sake, it's unfortunate because he's got a hole to dig himself out of. But from a fan's point of view, I like this prospect that we're building towards with this championship and uh, definitely could make things a little bit more interesting and fun down the stretch. But uh, that's my opinion on that. Maybe you guys have a different one. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts and opinions uh, as well. Uh, talk about the 250 class real quick. Colt Nichols dodged a big old bullet in this one, in my opinion. Seems like every 250 rider in this class has gotten hurt. Michael Moseman broke his hand in practice, missed the night show. Uh, you know, obviously we've, we've seen Jet Reynolds, uh, Jet Reynolds, Jet Lawrence have his issues missed around last week, and then Austin Forkner's out, and RJ Hampshire's out, and uh, you know the list goes on and on and on and on. This just, just field is decimated at this point. And Nichols gets the whole shot in the main event and crashes three, four corners into the main. Very, very lucky to just slide over the top of the tabletop as he crashed. Like, he cross ruts, goes, you know, forward over the next jump face and then kind of slides on top of the tabletop in the middle of the rhythm section. And, ooh, it could have been worse. It could have been plow into that jump and uh, really get yourself hurt, which would have sucked because, uh, I mean, Nichols is having a great year. But because this field is decimated and because of the way this championship is breaking down at this point as soon as he got up and he looked I don't know reasonably okay from that crash I was 
pretty much not worried for him. Um, you know, he kind of proved in his heat race he's better than Christian Craig right now. So Craig got the, the race win. You know, kudos to him. If he can turn this thing around, big, you know, that's going to be big, obviously. But right now, it seems like Colt Nichols has the upper hand uh, in terms of raw speed and race pace and everything like that. And maybe even mentally, because there's more things coming up in Craig's uh, camp that's looking a little bit strange there. Regardless of which, Nichols did charge through the field. Nichols did take a little bit of time battling with Jet Lawrence because, you know, Lawrence was, you know, <laughs> keeping him behind him with some interesting defensive riding. And then he got around him, got around Mitchell Oldenburg, and then got third in the race and didn't lose that much points in the end. Only lost five points from where he was sitting. So he's still in a really, really good spot for this championship, in my opinion. I think that those Star Yamahas will get up front more often than not. The only caveat to that is I think that he can really kind of put this thing more or less back to bed if he goes and wins Orlando this weekend. But if he doesn't and Craig wins again, I think all hell, all hell has a chance to break loose just because there's a huge break from this first Orlando, which is the last East round for a long time until Salt Lake City won, which is the last only East round before the East West showdown at Salt Lake City 2. I think there's... What, what, this weekend is going to be February 13th, and then uh, the first Salt Lake City is the last weekend of April. So you have, I guess, basically two and a half months is how you'd put it uh, between rounds, and that's you know a lot of time for maybe Hampshire gets healthy and wants to come back. Maybe Forkner decides he wants to race again. Uh, you know, maybe uh, Voland is back. All these other guys, and not that I think that all of those guys can beat Colt Nichols. But if Colt Nichols has another instance like he has at the start of the main event this week and Craig gets out front early and you have more depth in the field at that Salt Lake City one round and Craig has already won at Orlando and points are close and then suddenly Craig might leave with the points lead at the first Salt Lake City and then you go to the East-West Showdown, like that's where things can start stacking up against him. I don't think that's personally going to happen. Nichols looks like he's still pretty much on top of his game right now. And... Uh, you know, just besides that crash, like he had pretty much a almost flawless night, like actually did get a good start in the main event, which is not Nichols Forte, uh, passed his teammates straight up in the heat race and gapped him and uh, arguably was the fastest rider on the track in the main event. Anyway, he just didn't have the time to get to the very, very front of the field. So um, it is what it is. You know, that crash is going to kind of haunt him a little bit because he would have liked to win this one as well win four in a row be huge in the points lead go in Orlando with a little bit less pressure maybe win again and then put this thing pretty much entirely to bed before we even get to Salt Lake City uh, but it does leave open a little bit more opportunity now so that's all I'm kind of trying to hit on with that very excited for Joe Shimoda to get his uh, best career finish of a second place it was his uh, second career Supercross podium after he podiumed at Indy 1 and uh he was very happy about this one, Indy 1. He was very much like, I didn't earn this podium. Jet and Christian took each other out, so I shouldn't really be here. This one, he was very much more like, I earned this. I'm happy about it. And it's also the best main event finish ever for a Japanese rider in Supercross, which I thought was kind of cool. Akira Narita had finished fifth in the 125cc main event at A1 in 2005. So uh, Shimoda, with his third place at Indy 1, had tied Narita for the best finish for a Japanese rider in a main event. Now he has that distinguished title all to himself which is kind of crazy you know like japan has basically made you know the top four motorcycle brands for the last four decades i guess and now you know ktm and austria is coming into play here a little bit but you know honda suzuki yamaha kawasaki they have kind of owned the market for a long time and they are all japanese and they've had japanese riders that have been very good over the years but none of them have ever really come over and translated that uh, success that they've had in japan or wherever they came from into supercross now shimoda did move to the u.s when he was young so it's not like he's like full-blown like spent all his time growing up in japan then just came over here but as you guys can probably tell you know, he's not like so super proficient in English. He still uh, has a lot of Japanese heritage. And um, I just think that's really cool to see, uh, you know, a little bit more of the foreign flavor, someone fresh faced like this, a kid that seems like he's got his head on straight and, and really wants this championship. Uh, oh, what are we doing here? Really wants to be in this championship fight, uh, come out there, get a second place. And honestly, with the way that this class continues to go, could he get a win this year? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, it's going to take him starting in front of Craig or Nichols and just 
basically being able to hold him off or hoping that they don't start with him. But uh, speed-wise, he's shown he's, he's pretty competitive, I think. Uh, he was great in his heat race. He basically straight up passed Jet Lawrence before he got a little bit freaked out and crashed. But, you know, he's a sophomore just like Lawrence is. And instead of, you know, all the hype around Lawrence, Shimoda has flown significantly under the radar. For better or for worse, it's actually, I think, helped him a lot develop in this second year because... You know, there's not been a lot of pressure on him. He was the second rider at Monster Energy Pro Circuit Kawasaki. Now he's proving he's every bit as good as, you know, a lot of people on that team. I don't know if I'd put him above Forkner, but I think he's a very solid, like, number two rider on that team right now. And I think in the years come, he could be a number one guy there. And um, that's really cool to see. I'm just, I'm stoked for the kid. He seems like a good guy and uh, hopefully he continues to build on this strong second place finish. Um, but anyway, I don't really have much more else to say. Uh kind of breaking down everything I can think of from Indy. I'm sure I'll talk a lot more about it on the Pulp MX show tonight. Wherever you guys are watching, be sure to tune in. I'd really appreciate it stopping by and uh, showing your support and letting everybody know in chat or wherever you guys are watching from that uh, you're a fan of SYS and um, you've been supporting for all these years and stuff like that. I always appreciate you guys and the support you give me and uh, makes me be able to do some really cool, awesome things in this world and um, you guys are just awesome and the best in my opinion so yeah that's gonna be all for indy 3 hopefully you guys enjoyed this one if you guys have any comments questions concerns be sure to hit up the comment section below and uh, i'll see you guys in the next one so long for now